Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to whip through the rest of this because I really feel I can't leave it in the middle. I won't do any other documents like this. Uh, the war scroll will, will go through quicker. But this is um, such an incredible document too, but you see we can get through this much faster than the Damascus document because there's not much that is uh, unclear in it. Okay, so they are separate from the men of unright unrighteousness in order to be a community of Torah, common possessions, under the authority of the sons of Zadok, the priests who are keepers of the covenant. So this is another definition of sons of Zadok now. Keepers of the covenant. Five, two. And that's repeated again, I think, later on in this... Uh, in this um, so keeping the covenant makes you a son of Zadok. Now that's not a normative um, definition completely, although it's more normative than the Damascus document. The Damascus document, as you recall, the sons of Zadok were the, um, the people who would stand in the last times and uh, justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. The priests were the penitents in the wilderness. Um, so, Let's see. So they can be um, loving piety, modesty of ways, line four. Circumcise the foreskins of their desire, line five. Be a firm foundation for truth in Israel. You've heard all this. Community of the everlasting covenant, line five and six. So again, uh, we're... Um, more or less the same idea, but all synonyms for this name. Volunteers for the sake of the holiness of uh, Aaron. Condemn all lawbreakers, line 7. Anyone entering the council of the community, coming into the covenant, under the eyes of all the volunteers, shall swear from his soul with a binding oath to return to the Torah of Moses and everything that commanded. So again, from those <coughs> In accordance with all that was revealed according to the sons of Zadok, who are the priests, the keepers of the covenant, and the seekers after his will. <coughs> so the, the priests, again, are the keepers of the covenant, the sons of Zadok. It's more normative than um, the Damascus arguments. And there's slight differences, perhaps, in these two documents. And uh, again, the same thing. The volunteers of the community for his truth to walk in his will, line 10. That which he swore upon his soul by the covenant to separate from all the men of unrighteousness. We're going to hear that again when we make a way in the wilderness momentarily. It's going to be in column 8. They're not to be reckoned in his covenant since they have not asked concerning or studied his law to know the hidden things in which they have gone astray and their own guilt. Now, what the hidden things are, I don't know. And anyway, They've shown contempt, kindling the wrath of judgment, the avengers of the vengeance, of the curses of the covenant to execute upon them majestic judgments of eternal destruction without a remnant. Again, we, uh, we, uh, we've heard that all before. He shall not enter the water in order to touch the purity. Line 13, that's a new idea. The water is the immersion, the daily baptism. Touch the purity, the pure food. We don't know what that was, some kind of a pure meal, vegetarian or otherwise consecrated meal of some kind. Josephus talks about that to some extent with regard to Essenes, of the men of holiness or the holy ones. For they shall not be cleansed, even if they turn away from their wickedness. Because those who break the word, his word, are polluted. And again, no one should cooperate with him in work, meaning work like service or mission, or purse or riches, lest he contract his sinfulness. Again, I think I told you last time that in Acts, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark split uh, uh, split company. And Acts, at the end of Acts 15, beginning of Acts 16, John Mark and Barnabas will no longer travel with Paul. And um, in Galatians, uh, Peter and Barnabas break company from Paul. 
Now, whether that's what we're talking about here, not cooperate with him in work, they certainly don't cooperate with him any longer in work according to Acts. Now, Acts is on Paul's side and condemns them, not vice versa. Paul says, I will not travel with that man, John Mark, who deserted our work in Pamphylia. How many are familiar with that reference in Acts? Acts 16, the reference is to Acts 13. Uh, don't you cooperate with him? So we have shunning here or non-cooperation in mission. There is a mission of some kind. And therefore, no man among the men of the community shall act possess to their authority in any matter of Torah or judgment. He shall not eat anything by means of their purse or drink or take anything from their hands whatsoever. These people are like gone. It's pretty tough stuff. Um, you must separate from all those not reckoned in his covenant. All his possessions are polluted. So I'm skipping longer because I might as well. Uh, again, each man will obey his fellow, the man of lower rank, line 23, the man of higher rank. So we've heard all of that. Column 6. To these rules they shall walk wherever they dwell, each man towards his neighbor, the lower to obey the higher. Line two, again, they shall eat in common, pray in common, deliberate in common. Common table, very much like early Christians, or Essenes if you prefer. Uh, when they prepare the table to eat and the new grapes to drink, the priest shall stretch out his hand and bless the first fruits and the new grapes. Uh, and in the place where ten are present, they shall never lack a man to study Torah day and night. That's the Jewish minion it's called for prayer, ten men. And many will keep vigil together a third of all the nights of the year to read the book and to seek judgment and pray together. So they stay up a third of the nights of the year. The Koran says something similar about the early Muslims. And then the <coughs> king again. Let's skip along here. Examining a person, his spirit, his works. Line 17 of column 6. Again, the overseer, the Mibakir. We hear about him at the end of the Damascus document. He's the one that uh, keeps track of all this stuff. Line 20. More about rank. Line 22 and so on. I'm hurrying to get to chapters, chapter 8. And nine. Column seven. Column eight. Nine. Um, more of this person who has blasphemed now at the bottom of six, the glorious name. These are the penances. By the way, see, when the Mipakara is mentioned in column six, see if you skip something, you're in trouble. You, like 20, this person is expelled for uh, uh, two years. He will be re-examined. And if a man hasn't put his, his lied about his property, we have that in the book of Acts. They shall separate him from the purity for one year. Penance, a quarter of his bread. He raised his hand one year. If he utters the glorious name, that is, if he speaks the forbidden name of God, that's what blasphemy is according to Talmudic literature. Whether even in jest, like if I say, oh God, I'm done. Or as a result of some reversal, or for any other reason, even if I read the book of praying, he shall be expelled. I'm gone. And return no more to the council of the community. And if he speaks to one of the priests, the scribes, in the book in anger he shall do penance for one year and separate on pain of death from the purity he spoke unintentionally six months deliberately lied six months deliberately insult his fellow here's the pen here's the punishments that you have in the second part of the Damascus book one year speaking deceptively six months neglectfully three months I don't know what the penance is um, taking physical vengeance, one year. Other stupidities, 
<laughs> Three months. <laughs> Interrupting his neighbor's words. Ten days. Falling asleep in the session. Let's see what I can get you guys here. <laughs> 30 days. <laughs> um, whoever leaves a session of the many without permission up to three times in one sitting, 10 days. If you go to the bathroom too many times, we'll get you for 10 days. If he gets up and leaves completely, 30 days. I like this stuff, funny, huh? If he spits in the midst of the session, 30 days. And wherever carelessly is attired, takes his hand from under his cloak, I guess, so you see his privy parts or something. So his nakedness becomes visible 30 days. And if someone guffaws, this is actually in the Damascus time, out loud, so foolishly that his voice can be heard 30 days penance. And whoever raises his left hand and gesticulates with it 10 days. Slander your brother. One year. What's gesticulates? The man who murmurs, slandering the many, by the way, I think we're getting to Paul now, he shall be expelled from among them and never return. The man who murmurs against the foundation of the community shall be expelled and return no more. He's only murmured against his fellow, not the community, without justification six months. Or if the man returns, the spirit is so changed in regard to the foundation of the community, as to betray the truth and walk in stubbornness of heart two years. In the first year he shall not touch the pure food. Second, he shall not touch the drink of the many. Only be seated in the men of the community, and with the completion of the two full years, the many shall examine his work, and they shall permit him to enter. He shall be inscribed according to his rank, according to the question regarding the judgment, and so on. And the, uh, let's see, about backsliding, betraying the community. Walking in stubbornness of heart, betray the community, walk some, he shall never return to the council of the community. This is my feeling that Paul was among this group and fell out with them in this one. And any man of the man and just started his own movement, different movements. There can be two Jesus movements, you know, one a physical Jesus, one a spiritual Jesus. Any man of the men of the community mixes with him with regard to table fellowship, common purse. In a way not authorized, the many is the name by the way for the rank and file of the community. The judgment will be the same as previously. He shall be expelled. Uh, and there shall be in the council of the community, now we're getting into important stuff now. Twelve men, three priests. That resembles the twelve men of the twelve apostles. And the inner three even though they're here, they're called priests. You know, there's an inner three in Christianity, and, a, and there's also a, a, um, uh, the twelve. Where are the inner three? In Christianity, there was, um, it's uh, um, um, John, James, and uh, um, Peter. And, uh, and Jesus takes them and transfigures himself, according to the gospel, before them. But in the letter of Galatians, it's James, the brother of the Lord, and Kevin. And John. Not John the brother of James. Not James the brother of John, but James the brother of Jesus or the Lord. But anyway, similar. I don't say it's the same, but it's another parallel. Perfect in all that was revealed from the Torah, doing truth, again doing righteousness, justification, judgment, loving piety. There's loving piety again. Each man to his neighbor, that's righteousness toward your neighbor, to keep the faith in the land with steadfastness, a humble spirit atoned for sin by doing judgment, and suffering affliction. Notice you keep you 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 atone by suffering by suffering. And with the existence of these in Israel, the council of community is established on truth, like an eternal plantation. We heard about that plantation at the beginning of the Damascus. A house of holiness, or a temple, if you like, for Israel. And the foundation of a holy of holies for Aaron. We're playing off the temple with spiritualized temple imagery. In other words, the uh, Israel members of this group are the temple. The priest members, the central three of priests, are the holy of holies. 
was a spiritualized, um, allegorical, if you like, image, uh, you know, symbolic uh, situation here. Witnessing of the truth for judgment and the chosen of his will to make atonement for the land, like Jesus in the scripture, to pay the wicked their reward. We'll see that in the, in the Habakkuk commentary. It'll be a tested rampart, a precious cornerstone. We've heard that about Jesus in the scripture. The foundation of which will not shake or sway in their place. It will be a dwelling of the Holy of Holies for Aaron. Holy of Holies was the inner sanctum of the temple. With everlasting knowledge of the covenant of judgment, offering up a pleasing fragrance, a whole house of perfection and truth in Israel, offering up a tr pleasing fragrance. Paul speaks about that in Philippians, where he speaks about Epaphroditus offering up a pleasing fragrance. Uh, to establish an everlasting covenant of laws, it will be an acceptable free will offering to atone. So they are the they are the sacrifice, just as in Christianity, Jesus is the sacrifice. To atone for the Lamb. But this is the community council, the central twelve. And there will be no more unrighteousness. When these have been confirmed in perfection of the way, perfection of the way again, for two whole years, by the foundation of the community, they will be set aside as only <coughs> within the council of the men of the community. In other words, these are really consecrated ones, set aside as holy. These are Nazarites, lifelong, complete Nazarites. That's where I think they got the idea of Nazar Nazarenes, Nazaren, Nazrites, uh, however you want to speak about Naz something uh, related to Christianity. Here we have a community of Nazarites, perfect ones. And the guide will not hide from them, the muscul, any matter revealed by him but hidden from Israel out of fear of that spirit of heresy. There may be some secret matters, you see that these perfect people can hear. Maybe the law isn't binding on some people, who knows? And with the existence of these for a community in Israel, according to these regulations, these holy people, these inner twelve and three, guess what? They shall separate from the midst of the habitation of the men of unrighteousness to go into the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, I don't see how anyone who reads that can think we're in any period but the time of John the Baptist. I mean, that's almost word for word the way John the Baptist is described, isn't it? Huh? Yep. Anyone has read scripture would uh, say that John is defined differently than that? This is it. Just a more detailed way of presenting it. Scripture is a little more compressed. As it is written, but the point of view is different, I admit. Because I think the point of view of the scripture we have is polarized. That's my personal, professional opinion. And this is, if you like, if you or you can go the other words, this is Jamesianized. <coughs> <laughs> you know, take your pick, you know, whichever side of the two you're on. I mean, it's okay. You can be on either side you prefer. But the compare the way of the wilderness is not in dispute. As it is written, prepare, uh, prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord, make straight in a desert a pathway for our God. John came <laughs> preaching in the wilderness saying, and that is the exact quote. How can you get any closer than that? And then how can people say this has nothing to do with Christianity? You see? What do they do? They depend that the people at large don't read these documents. And therefore, they go out with these theories that they tell the people what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are, are about, and the people listen to them because they're scholars, but the people don't read the documents themselves. Which is why I take the time to read the documents, not all the scholars. Because to me, the documents are the prime source. You can read the scholars later if you want. Most I read the scholars to find out what not to think. But anyway, I don't want to push that too far. But until you read the documents, what's the point of reading what the scholars say about the documents? That's putting the horse, the cart before the horse. That can bowl you over right there. Anyway, you won't agree with the next thing. This is the study of Torah, which he commanded by the hand of Moses, to do all that has been revealed from age to age. Which the prophet has revealed through his Holy Spirit. And any man of the community, back to our backsliders, deliberately turns aside 
like the end of the Damascus talk, on any point whatsoever. Not one jot or tittle shall disappear from the law until all these things are accomplished, saith Jesus, even in the Gospels as we James, if you break one small point of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. The community rule, who turns aside from the commandments on any point whatsoever is not to approach the purity of the men of holiness, the real Nazarites here. And he shall know none of their doctrine until his works have been washed clean more purification of unrighteousness. And he once more walks perfectly it walks in perfection of the way. Uh, he, then he can approach the council of the many according to the rank, and the judgment will apply to all who join the community. These are the judgments in which the men of perfect holiness. Now, you think that Paul doesn't know about this group? Look at this here. I read it to you before, but I'll read it to you again. 2 Corinthians 6. Here he's sort of mixing it up a bit, and actually he doesn't sound like his previous stuff, which is very odd. But uh, do not uh, equally yoke the unbelievers with the believers. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? This is very much like this document. What does light fellowship have? Does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? It's really he means Belial here. What part does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement does the sanctuary of God have with idols? For you are a sanctuary of the living God. That's exactly what we have here. Even as God said, I will live in them and walk with them, and I will be their God, they should be my people. So come out from among them and separate, saith the Lord. Well, that's what's being said here. It's totally different from anything else Paul says in any of the other letters. For some Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will receive you, God speaking. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, saith the Lord. There is a document in the scrolls called the Four Legion, which has that almost precise quote. Hopefully we'll get to it. Then, loved ones, having these promises to make ourselves clean from every pollution of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the spirit, in the fear of God. There's the perfect holiness ideology. Making perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's 2 Corinthians. Now that I admit is a different spirit than what we've been reading before from Paul and sounds almost exactly like this. Here it is. They shall be a community of, 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 of perfect holiness. It's word for word. It's also the Damascus. And to walk each towards his fellow, all coming to the council of holiness, to walk in perfection of the way, in the manner commanded, any man of them who breaks one word of the Torah of Moses, one jot or tittle, whether overtly or covertly, then Vermesh has that wrong. It's overtly or covertly, whether you do it straight or you do it hiding. What does Vermesh say there in 22? Huh? No, what's, the, how does he put it? Overtly or covertly. He says overtly and covertly? He didn't used to. Maybe he's still stolen something from me. <laughs> All right, well, he says overtly or covertly? Okay. Shall be expelled from the council of the community and return no more. He didn't used to have that. He's changed it. And no matter the man of holiness shall mix with him in purse or doctrine in anything whatsoever. So again, shunning. And if he did it by accident, okay, now the penance against. Again. Um, he should be examined, and so on, and then uh, he shouldn't err again, two full years, and so on and so forth, back to these things. And then finally, uh, column nine, more about infractions. With the existence of these in Israel, line three, according to all these regulations, the Holy Spirit shall be established upon truth forever, Holy Spirit again. They shall atone for the guilt and sin and rebellious transgression and be a pleasing sacrifice without the flesh of burnt offering and the fat of sacrifice. So they are the sacrifice. They make the atonement, just like Jesus in the New Testament. And prayer rightly offered will be like a sweet smell of righteousness 
an acceptable free will offering of perfection of the way. These walkers in perfection line six will be separated as the house of holiness for Aaron, the community of the Holy of Holies, and the house of the community for Israel. We've heard about that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. They shall uh, not mix with the riches of the men of lying, or wash their way in order to separate from unrighteousness. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and finally, nor shall they turn aside from any counsel of the Torah to walk in stubbornness of heart, shall be judged according to the judgments of the first, line 10, in which the men of the community were first instructed, the forefathers, until the prophet and the Messiah of Aaron and Israel shall come. Now, um, there's a prophet, and I have a, a side like the true prophet of Ebionite ideology, and also the Messiah of Aaron and Israel. Some people say Messiahs of Aaron and Israel, but the, the verbs are singular. It's the same as in the Damascus document, where it literally is Messiah of Aaron and Israel, not Messiah. Anyway, I don't know what to make of all that, but it's just, again, similar to the Damascus document. I'm sorry, so the, the prophet and the Messiah of Aaron and Israel is referring to one person. I don't know about that. Messiah of Aaron and Israel is referring to one person. But whether the prophet is to be grouped with them or, you know, it could be an idiomatic kind of language. Yeah, it's a good point. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that is the same. Like, just like the Ebionites think that uh, that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, the Ebionites, I've told you, if not the, the community in, in early Christianity that thought that Jesus was only a man who, uh, excelling about other men in righteousness, only a, a prophet. Uh, born by natural generation, Eusebius in the fourth century, Constantine's bishop, condemns them. But they followed James, and they were called Ebionites because of this Ebion idea we're going to get here in the Damascus, in the Habakkuk Conference. But anyway, do you yeah. think this is the same prophet in Deuteronomy? Yeah, and we're going to get it again in the True Prophet. Uh, in the, we're going to get that whole prophecy in that floral legium that I told you. Um, no, there's, a, there's a, um, two documents, the floral legium, and these are like proof texts that people hang out, and one of them has that prophecy in it. Um, it's called the, uh, <coughs> the Testimonia. Testimony. You can find it in your index. <coughs> um, let's go on, because I want to get on with another document. And uh, they are to evaluate the sons of the Tzaddik. Now, 14, it's the Tzaddik, uh, or the Zadok. Some people say it's a mistake. There shouldn't be a the in there. I don't know if there's, it's a mistake, or I'm not in a p position to know if it's a mistake. Anyway, I think these are all interchangeable. The Tzaddik, the Zadok, Zadok, Zedek. One is righteous one, one is the name of David's high priest, the other is uh, righteousness. Nor should you listen to this one. Each man shall draw near in accordance with whether he has clean hands and advance his intelligence, and thus he shall, line 16, love together with his hatred. Nor should he admonish or argue with the men of the pit. We heard about the men of the pit in the Damascus document. But rather he shall conceal the counsel of the Torah from the men of unrighteousness, and admonish with knowledge of truth and judgment of righteousness the elect of the way, each man coming to his spirit according to the rule of the age. He shall comfort them in knowledge, and thus illumine them in marvelous mysteries and truth to the men of the community to walk perfectly, each with his neighbor, that is, love your neighbor by, as yourself, in all that was revealed to them. And then again. Which is why I'm reading. This is the time of the making of a way in the wilderness. Repeated a second time. That to me with the baptism and the cursing are the most important parts of the community rule. And also the spiritualized atonement. A lot of important parts. Spiritualized atonement and so on. But this is the time of the making of a way in the wilderness. And what is that way? Let's see. Uh, therefore he shall instruct them in all that has been revealed to do unto this time to separate from any man who has not turned his way away from unrighteousness 
about the wilderness, and these are the rules of the way for the guide, the muskeel in these times, relating to his loving together with his hating. Again, no love here for your enemy. Everlasting hatred for the men of the pit. Sometimes, however, in a spirit of secrecy. They may be too powerful to show it openly. Leave them to their riches and the toil of their hands, like a servant to the master or the meek, before the individual dictating him. Eh, you know, don't worry about those men of the pit. Rather, secretly perhaps, he shall be a man, you, person of this group, following this way, zealous for his law, a zealot again. He says zealot for the precept, but the word is law. And his time, that is, this man who is zealous for the law, and his time, that is, the, a man zealous for the day of vengeance. And that can be the last judgment, or it can be the day when we're going to reckon all these things up. This is not peaceful. To do all his will according to the workless hands and always to me as he commanded. He shall be freely delight in all that happens to him, but other than by God's will, nothing should please him. He should delight in all that has been said by his mouth, but he should not desire anything he does not command. He should always be mindful of the judgment of God to bless his Creator. No matter what occurs, bless him with his lips. That's as far as I want to go in that document. There's some more abstruse sort of, um, you know, poetic stuff afterwards. But we get the picture. He shall be as a man zealous for the law whose time is the day of vengeance. <laughs> is this Bin Laden? Pretty close. Pretty close. you got to admit that. Pretty close. You said, that's not my religion. Say, so, okay, but... <laughs> Uh, your religion may have um, sprung from this in Palestine. Good or bad, however you want to put it. Okay, we've done the community rule. Quick look at the war scroll. Okay? I should, um, you asked about that. I don't know if I brought it. I don't think I brought it. Uh, let me see. I've got a copy of it here. That's the one you the testimony. Here's for Legium in Vermesh is 493. Uh, I told you that one passage I think is in here uh, about um, being a um, let's see about um, well, let's look here at just uh, it's a lot to do with David, this floral legion. The Lord declares that he will build you a house, line 10, will raise up your seed, meaning David, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father and he shall be my son, quoting Samuel 7. So this is a quote from Samuel. And then the interpretation is, he is the branch of David who shall arise along with the interpreter of the, of the law to, to either rule in Zion or just arise in Zion at the end of time. So that they do believe in a Davidic Messiah. What, what page are you on? 494. They do believe in a Davidic Messiah, as you see. And anyone who thinks that this is not a Davidic group, and then, of course, what do they do? Go and quote what we've already heard in the Damascus document and James's speech in Acts. As it is written, I will raise up the tent of David that is fallen from uh, Amos 9-11. Don't forget 9-11. Total key to connect James with the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the Damascus document, with the Davidic monarchy. I don't know what it all means, but here it's all here. That is to say, the fallen tent of David is he who shall arise to save Israel. I don't know if his translation is right. I'd have to get the Hebrew to see, but this, this is good enough for us. And then the testimony. You were asking about that uh, true prophet. There it is right there. Deuteronomy 18, 18. 495. You have heard the words which people have spoken. All they have said is right. All their hearts were always like this, to fear me, to keep my commandments, always that it may be well with them and their children. That's Deuteronomy 5. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall tell them all that I commanded him. I require a reckoning of whoever will not listen in the words which the prophet shall speak in my name. Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. That's the true prophet you were asking about. Everything's here. Everything's here. Uh, I'm not sure if we have the star prophecy here or not. I think we do. <coughs> oh yeah, there it is. The very next one in the testimony. Oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, oracle of man whose eyes penetrating, oracle of him who has heard the words of God, who knows the wisdom of the Most High, sees the vision of the Almighty, falls, and his eyes are open. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. He shall crush the temples of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Numbers 24, 17. So there's the star prophecy, too. We call that document the uh, testimony. I don't want to. Uh, Take too much time on that. You can look at those if you want. I'm going to go to the War Scroll where we will also have the Star of Prophecy. So in the Florilegium, we have the Tent of David, which has fallen, and now in the War Scroll, we have the Star of Prophecy. As well. Let's look at the War Scroll real quick here. I don't know what page is near, but I'll, this old book of mine is sufficient. For the Master, the Rule of War. The unleashing of the attack of the sons of light against the sons of darkness, the army of Satan. Against the band of Edom, Moab, the sons of Ammon, the sons of the east, Philistines, against the bands of the Katim of Assyria, and their allies, the ungodly of the covenant. Against a whole bunch here, and their uh, ungodly ones in Israel. They are cooperators, the cooperators. This is supposed to be anti-Maccabean, this document. This is a Maccabean style. Sons of Levi, Judah, and Benjamin. Now, Benjamin is defined as the exiles in the desert here. The diaspora of the desert. Paul says he's of the tribe of Benjamin. This is defining, Benjamin doesn't exist anymore. Paul's time. He can't be of the tribe of Benjamin. It, 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 it's, not, um, it's not something that's being used at that time. 600 years before, perhaps. But you just have Levites, Jews. But here Benjamin is the, is the, desert, uh, the desert camp people. I don't know if that helps. I think it does. All the bands, when the exiled sons of light return from the desert of the peoples, Jesus in the scripture goes to Galilee of the peoples. But Galilee is not of the peoples. Galilee is a Jewish area at this time. But here the desert of the peoples, I think it means the Syrian desert, to the camp in the desert of Jerusalem, near the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were. And this is the time of salvation for the people of God. Again, Yeshua. Oh, going along, I can't read it all. And doing life of all the sons of light. On that day when the Ketim fall, there shall be a battle and terrible carnage before the God of Israel. What is team? Well, that's what we're going to discuss. We're going to hold that off at the moment. Because that's the big decision. Who the Ketim are. We want to look at the, uh, the Habakkuk and uh, Psalm 37 next time in the side. Okay. At that time, the assembly of the gods, host of men, show battle, the Katim of the enemy, anyway. Now, we've had the Katim in the Daniel, which is why I read that in the Maccabee books, which is why I read it. In one Daniel, there are the Romans. In one Maccabees, there are the Alexander and Greeks. Sons of Light to battle with the company of darkness. On that day, the battle against the Katim, there shall be a lot of carnage. And so on and so on. So, more of this battle laid out in column two. Twelve priests shall minister to the daily sacrifice. So we've laid this all out here. During the remaining 33 years of the war in column two here, I don't know how many years this war is supposed to last. Um, let's see. I don't know um, what happened to the first part of the war. How many years was that? Did you see? Well, I don't know if it's um, 
if it's a 40 years or a 70 years war, I think it's a 70 years, but anyway, from Daniel. During the remaining 33 years of the war, the men of renown, and the summer of the assembly together, all the heads of the family of the congregation will choose for themselves fighting men from all the lands of the nations, and they shall arm themselves warriors from all the tribes of Israel. In the 35 years of service, the war shall be fought during six, the whole congregation shall be fight together. During the remaining 29 years, the war shall be divided. Well, you know, it's um, pretty ideal idealized, but on the other hand, it's also um, pretty serious. So <coughs> column three, you can see what you think about the numbers there. We have what they're going to write on their trumpets. Listen to what they write on their trumpets. The call of God, the princes of God, the army of God, summoned by the God of the council of holiness, the peace of God in the camps of his saints, the mighty deeds of God shall crush the enemy, putting to flight all those who hate righteousness and bringing shame on those who hate him. Formations of the dark, divisions of the God for vengeance of his wrath on the sons of darkness, reminder of vengeance in God's appointed times. On the trumpets of massacre they shall write, the mighty hand of God of war shall cause all the ungodly <coughs> slain to fall. God has smitten all the sons of darkness. How many have heard of Cromwell and his war in England where he led a mighty Protestant army and he had all these banners? I mean, this was like Cromwell's army. You're blinding, but you probably know something about Cromwell and his army. I mean, they had all these slogans from the Psalms and from the Old Testament on their banners when they marched to war in England uh, in the prelude to the founding of America, because the people who were, were disappointed in the outcome of all those things in England came to America and founded America, which is where we get all our things like this crazy battle hymn of the Republic and things like that. These kinds of slogans and things of you know, God's army and onward Christian soldiers and stuff like that. It's a very similar spirit. Now, the normal presentation of this document was, these people aren't serious. This is just a symbolic struggle. Now, I don't think they would take the time to write this battle blueprint for symbolism. Now, you'll have to decide that. The people who were talking about peaceful Essenes and everything found this, doc uh, this document and said, what's this doing here? This was in Cave Warren. Uh, it may not be a very um, realistic war plan, in the sense that I don't think I'd like to follow these people any more than I think I'd want to follow Bin Laden today. But we are living a time now that we know these things are serious. And to me, this is a serious document. I don't think this is symbolic that they, what they're talking about. What do you think? To me, it's serious stuff. They don't go writing all these slogans on their banners and everything without being serious. Look at column four. Uh, now we've got what's going to be on the banners. The wrath of God is kindled against Belial, against the men of his company, leaving no remnant. The God, from God comes the might of war against all sinful flesh. The truth of God, the justice of God, the glory of God, the judgment of God, the splendor of God, the congregation of God, the camps of God, the vision of God, the war of God, the vengeance of God, the power of God, the examination of God of all the nations of vanity, the salvation of God, the victory of God, the help of God, the support of God. All these are the slogans on their paraphernalia. This is our battle patches. Well, this group is probably not going to beat the Roman army. <laughs> We're not too interested in the slogans on banners. So they're like a mechanized brute force, you know, boom, 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 you know, and crush everything. It's a professional army, you know. This is not a professional army, unfortunately for them. But it's enthusiastic. And the war against Rome in 66 to 70 was enthusiastic. They gave Rome a very hard time, and once again in the Barcocco period. We didn't even know this could be the Barcocco period for all that. Holdouts who rewrote this material for the Barcocco War, 132 to 136. We only talk about uh, 66 to 70, but this could be even the later war. We, we don't know. But it's certainly not peaceful. I think you'll, uh, you'll give me that. He shall accomplish mighty deeds for his people, chapter 6. See, the mighty deeds and works, the mighty works and wonders of God in the war scroll, you see, are not, as in the New Testament, the miracles Jesus does by curing and raising. And uh, if the mighty deeds and wonders were done here in Chorazin and Bethsaida, oh, you would have repented long ago or whatever. In the New Testament, the mighty deeds and wonders are the miracles of... Uh, 
you know, exorcisms, things like that. The war scroll is the battles God fights on behalf of his people. So that's why I say this is Palestinian. One last thing. Yeah, we'll do an evaluation tonight. What do you think? we got some time to do that, huh? We can do that. We'll do five more minutes here. Who will do the evaluation and who will conduct it? You, you conduct it okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's this point. The matter of the, so what you do is you do it, you put the number up there and you know, lick the thing and, and then uh, you have to take it up and stick it under the, you know, and put, take all the ones that are, that are not done, and, you know, they're empty, like, and put them in there with them. And seal it all up, sign it, you know. The man, I'll talk to you after you, you show you where to <laughs> The men of the army shall be from 40 to 50. The inspection cash will be 40 to 50, blah, blah, blah. Here's where I want to get to, seven. No boy or woman shall enter the camps from the time they leave Jerusalem and march out to war until they return. Hey, these, they're not going to write this just for an ac exercise. No man who is lame, blind, crippled, or afflicted with a lasting bodily blemish or smitten with bodily impurity, none of these shall march out to war with them. Why? It's a holy war. And this is the same as the temple. And you see now in the New Testament, all these people are acceptable. Jesus wants all these people to come unto him. It's again the opposite spirit of this. I'm not saying one is right, one's wrong. I just want to show the, the conflict there. They shall be, all be freely enlisted for war, perfect in spirit and body, ready for the day of vengeance. So this day of vengeance is this final apocalyptic war. Zealous for the law and for the day of vengeance. Here it's repeated here. And no man shall go down with them on the day of battle who is impure. Because of his uh, fount, as Vimesh puts it. You know what that means? Because he had a wet dream the night before. That's what that means. Say. For And the reason is all the holy angels are with their hosts. You see, they don't think they're going to win this war by themselves. They have a secret weapon. The holy angels are with them. And then and we're going to get the war, uh, we're going to get the star prophecy, and then after that we're going to get the picture of the coming of the heavenly host into their camps to help them fight this battle. They have an atomic bomb here. Let's try it. The angelic host. Well, I'll show it to you here. Like, just see. For, look at this, line, uh, column, column 12. I'm going to go back to this next time. For thou will fight with them from heaven. For the multitude of the holy ones are with thee in heaven, and the host of his angels in their holy abode, praising his name. And thou was established in a community for thyself, the elect of thy holy people. Now the list of the names of all their hosts is with thee. I hate to read it from this uh, Vermesh translation, but I haven't done a translation of this. And with thee in thy abode of holiness, thy glorious dwelling place, thou hast recorded for them with the, with the graving tool of life, the favors and blessings and the covenant of peace that thou mayest reign with them forever and ever. Thou wilt muster the hosts of thine elect in their thousands and mirrors with the heavenly holy ones and thine angels that they may be mighty in battle may smite the rebels on the earth by thy great judgments, and that they may triumph together with the elect of heaven. For thou art terrible, O God, and the glory of thy kingdom, and the congregation of thy holy ones is among us. There it is. For everlasting help, we will despise kings. We will mock and scorn the mighty, for our Lord is holy, and the King of glory is with us, together with his holy ones. It means <coughs> angels. Valiant warriors of the angelic host are among our numbered men, and the hero of war is with our congregation. And the hosts of his spirits are with our foot soldiers and horsemen, and they are as clouds. Have I made my case to you that we're building up to the joining in this war of the heavenly host, and the reason for the purity of the camps is because in their view, I know it's crazy, the angels could not abide human impurity. And the camp must be totally pure. I'm going to pick that up next time. Finish this up here, and there shall be a space of about 200,000 cubits where you put the latrines. They go into all of that. Uh, so, in um, column, uh, column, um, column 11, you see, we start this thing about the battle is yours, God, and so on. My <laughs> great name, and so on. And uh, you see, they quote the star prophecy again. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter to rise from Israel, which will smite the temples of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. So that's the third quotation of the star prophecy. Josephus, remember, said at the end of the Jewish war, the people who fought this war against Rome uh, were moved by a prophecy 
that a world ruler would come out of Palestine to rule the world. The Star of Prophecy. So this is the literature, to my mind, of the people who fought the final war against Rome. Anyway, we'll pick up there next time. We will be able to finish our, what we need to do. You read the Habakkuk uh, commentary, the Nahum commentary. Here, Christine, I'll give you this. I got some pencils here. And uh, let's see what class is this. Here, this one here. I'm sorry to make you do this. I, I, uh, I no, so, um, I'll get out of here. Let me give you the pencils if I can find them. I don't have the pencils. I can't do it. I hear they are. I hear the pencils. <coughs> Right, I'll go outside and, and I'll eat my orange. You can call me back, okay? Sorry, you guys. I don't do, like to click this on you. you know, I'm not trying to do it. Right, but I'm not. Ha, 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 ha. 